pause. What happened there? Why is one boat racing forward at almost twice the speed of the other? They both look to be the same length, and I could tell you that right now, they're being powered by the exact same engine and they weigh exactly the same. So what gives? Why is one so much faster than the other? Well, over the last week, I've run quite a few tests on five slightly different hulls to figure out which of them are the most efficient, fastest, and most stable. And today, I'll share with you all the surprising data that came out of this experiment as well as dive into the physics of why boat hulls work the way they do. If you've ever wondered how boats made of heavy materials like steel, fiberglass, and aluminum float, it's because of displacement. Once an object is dropped into a liquid like water, it displaces or takes up the space of water that was there to begin with. The same concept applies to boats. For a hull to float, it needs to displace more water by volume than its weight, and according to Newton's third law, the water being pushed aside by the hull produces an equal and opposite force that keeps the hull afloat. Let's take a closer look at two very different hull types and how they perform. Displacement hulls are a bit like icebergs because most of a displacement hull lies below the waterline. Usually they have large keels and are really smooth. In the real world, these hulls are found mostly on sailboats and long-range ocean-going vessels that prioritize range over speed. Planing hulls are much more boxy if you look at them head-on. They have a flatter bottom and are generally built to look more geometric. They have sharper edges and are less uniform in general. In the real world, you can find these hulls mostly in high-speed personal watercraft. The main difference between these two very popular hull types is that displacement hulls are meant for long-range travel and they are efficient and maneuverable at low speeds but are limited by their top speed. Planing hulls can reach insanely high speeds and are quite agile in the water, however they require more power and don't ride as smoothly through rough water. This is because instead of cutting through the water like a traditional displacement hull, planing hulls tend to lift themselves up and out of the water, reducing drag on the hull. I devised an experiment in which I tested five different planing hulls and compared their efficiencies at speed, their top speed, and their stability in rough weather. I hope to get a picture of what a well thought out hull would look like. In respecting the scientific process, I also made sure to eliminate any variables I could in the hull's construction. Each of the five hulls has exactly the same mass and is propelled by exactly the same engine and propeller. So, let's meet our competitors. Hull number one is a very aesthetically pleasing, accurate representation of a speedboat hull in real life. It has a curved bow and an extended bottom section. Hull number two is very similar to number one. It has the same curve but no bottom section and therefore has an extremely flat bottom, which is ideal for planing. Number three changes it up a bit. Instead of a curve, hull three opts for a more triangular wedge design but has a similar form overall. Number four is basically a copy of its predecessor, except it has sides that slope inward. And finally, hull number five is the same principle as hull three, except it's finished with 2x2 two two pyramids and wedges. The first parameter we'll be testing is fuel efficiency. Now would be a great time to make your predictions. Which of these hulls do you think will be most efficient? Which of them will be in the middle of the pack? And which will lag behind? For this test, I designed a system that uses a pit controller to set throttle. This way I can match the speed of every hull. Then, the efficiency data is relayed back to Crimward's fuel consumption microprocessor, from which I would note down and calculate the efficiency 8 separate times and average them out for a more accurate estimate. The first speed I tested the hulls at was 5 meters per second, or around 10 knots. None of these hulls have hit their planing speed yet, but they're still going quite fast. I'm going to say right now that all the figures I'm about to give you are measured in liters per hour. So without further ado, let's get into the results. Now, hull number one did about average, hitting an efficiency of about 274 liters per hour at 5 meters per second. Hull two achieved the same results, but hulls three and four were where we start seeing a small difference. The achieved efficiency is now only 216 liters per hour. This may seem a little insignificant, but it increases the runtime of your hull by at least half an hour and the savings only get larger from here. Finally, we have hull 5, which ranked below all the other competitors, achieving a measly 300 liters of diesel per hour. At 10 meters per second, or almost 20 knots, hull 1 had an efficiency of 1,323 liters per hour. Hull 2 went down to 974, hull 3 dipped even further to 753 liters per hour, and hull 4 was even more efficient at 714. The fifth one, once again, not doing so great at 1,022. Still better than one, though. Now, why is this? Why do we see an even greater greater difference. That is because all four hulls have reached their planing speed except for the first one, which is still plowing through the water instead of riding on top of it. As mentioned earlier, this reduces drag and improves the overall efficiency of the vessel. With a different design, we were basically able to cut in half our fuel consumption at 20 knots. The next speed I tested was at 12 meters per second, or 23 knots. At this velocity, hull 1 achieved 2,220 liters per hour, hull 2, 1,605, 
Hull 3, 1,290, and Hull 4, 1,193, and Hull 5 at 1,614. By now, we can see diminishing returns that come with an increase in speed. Using Hull 1 as an example, back when our speed was 5 meters per second, we were comfortably able to get a solid 2.5 hours out of our fuel tank, but increasing our speed by 2.5 times led to an increase of 8 times in our fuel consumption, so I'd say 10 knots is definitely a way better speed for long range cruising. But what if you're not in it for the long cruising range and you just want the best hull shape for pure speed? Well, we're gonna go there next. I cranked every throttle lever on each hull to one and waited to see which one of them would win. And the results may shock you. I'll start from the bottom. In last place, just barely surpassing 12 meters per second is hull number one. The fastest it can possibly go is 12 and a half meters per second, or 24 knots. Not too impressive. In third place, we have a tie between hull 2 and 5, which both maxed out at 50 meters per second or almost 30 knots. In second, we have hull 3 with another big leap to 17 and a half meters per second or 34 knots. And finally, I'm sure you all already know who the winner is. This hull managed to hit a staggering 18 and a half or 36 knots using the same engine, propeller, and mass. Going back to my intro where I compared two boats racing forward, it's pretty obvious which one is which now, isn't it? That's crazy how a few design features can lead to a speed difference of 12 knots. It is important, however, that the faster each boat went, it consumed significantly more fuel. The winner, for example, achieved a stupidly bad efficiency of 4,253 liters per hour. That means it'll burn through its 698 liter fuel tank in just 10 minutes. Finally, I want to touch a bit on hull stability at 100% wind. For this test, I went under the harbor a bit, and then as the vessel sat at 135 degree angle to the waves, I just let the scenario play out for around 50 seconds. Then I recorded the high and low peaks during the time frame from the tilt sensor. There really wasn't too much disparity in the roll of each hull, however, there's only one that performed the poorest, and that was hull number one, rolling from minus 70 to 70 degrees. Every other one rolled from minus 35 to 35 degrees. It's also important to know that these numbers don't represent the average roll, instead it's the maximum roll that I recorded during the 50 seconds that I tested them. Going back to our original question, what does the perfect hull look like? Well, the truth is there really is no such thing as the perfect hull. But if we optimize certain parameters, we can design a hull that's built to serve a purpose. In my case, I found that a 1x1 wedge hull combined with slanted sides produces a hyper-efficient and speedy planing hull. Even though it may not look the best, functionally, hull 4 still drastically overachieved compared to hull 1 in top speed, fuel efficiency, and stability. And style may be your goal, there's nothing wrong with that. But the next time you're designing a hull and trying to optimize these three parameters, remember that simple shapes like the ones I used in my fourth test hull are ideal. I know that this video really only discussed planing hulls, so if you do want to see a part two all about displacement hulls, let me know in the comments. Other than that, I really hope you enjoyed this video, and if you did, consider hitting that like and subscribe button if you haven't already. That's it for me today, and I will see you in the next one.